from Cambridge, Massachusetts, WHDH Public Affairs presents the Harvard Law School Forum. Tonight, recorded highlights on the subject LSD, Methods of Control. The featured speakers this evening are Dr. Timothy Leary, Castalia Foundation, and Dr. Norman E. Zinberg, Harvard Medical School. Now, to introduce Dr. Leary, here is the moderator, Professor Neil Cheyette. Assistant Professor of Legal Medicine, Boston University. Tonight we're going to talk about LSD. The, um, the thing that uh, I have been reading about LSD, and I expect many of you have been reading much about it, on the one hand it seems to be that it is considered uh, a breeder of psychosis, of panic, uh, death, suicide. And on the other hand, if you look at the uh, uh, September issue of Playboy, I have a battered car. I think all Playboys are battered. They publish them that way. But. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the Playboy article uh, implied, uh, implied that there was some um, other uh, gratification to taking LSD and that it was in reality a kind of a euphoria. Tonight we're going to find out something about it and our first speaker is uh, a man whose name I'm sure is familiar to all of you, uh, Dr. Timothy Leary who was born in 1920 in Springfield, Mass. Uh, he stayed a short time at West Point and then moved on to the University of Alabama where he received his A.B. and his, uh, then his master's from Washington State University and a Ph.D. from the University of California. Uh, he's taught at the uh, University of California and the medical school there and at Harvard where he was a lecturer on clinical psychology in the Department of Social Relations. Um, his legal position, which many of you are uh, interested in, I'm sure, is less clear at the moment. It, uh, he's never sure who's going to meet him at the airport. Uh, but I'd, <laughs> I'd like to uh, now introduce Dr. Timothy Leary. Dr. Leary. I'm very happy to be here tonight. I have a great fondness and respect for Harvard. I might say about Harvard, as Hank Bauer, the manager of the Baltimore Orioles, might have said about the Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, I think Harvard is the uh, best university in the National League. I think uh, Harvard is the best secular institution in the world. If I had to uh, turn over my external affairs, political, intellectual, scientific, to any institution in the world, I would uh, be most happy to do such to uh, this institution. However, I play in a different league. Harvard is a secular institution, and my business has to do with the sacred or the religious. Which brings me to my text, the text of my sermon tonight. I'm taking it from a hymn uh, written by a modern holy man, uh, Bob Dylan. The uh, name of the hymn is, uh, I Ain't Gonna Work on Maggie's Farm No More. Like Maggie's ma, I'm going to talk tonight about God and man and law and about the relationship between these uh, two issues. What should we render to society and what must we insist on preserving to ourself and our sense of divinity? And of course, the relationship of the law of God and the law of man has always been confused. God and Caesar, church and state. It seems to me that, in general, the state and society is interested that man do good, whereas people in my profession are interested in having man feel good. Society says you must do right. We try to teach you how to feel right. Now, first, I should define my terms, man and God. By man, of course, I mean society, social man, and the law which uh, governs what man does 
to other men uh, is certainly necessary. We need morals. We need to uh, determine right action. We have to protect one man or one woman from another man or another woman. There's no disagreement here. Caesar has his province, or I should say the many Caesars can fight over their provinces. You want to play baseball? There have to be rules. There are laws which govern property, maritime law, fiscal law, theological law, which determines the length of robes and so forth. We need laws to govern such external events. Now let me talk for a minute about God. The province of God, the territory of God, the realm of God, where is it? The realm of God is the human body. The gates of Eden are the senses, the perimeter of heaven is your skin. The temple is your body. Now what I'm uh, suggesting is a highly orthodox and ancient doctrine. Christ said it in all of his gospels. The kingdom of heaven, where is it? It's within. In the gospel of St. Thomas, Christ says, um, if you think heaven is up there, the birds will get there before you. Or if you think it's down there, the fish will get there before you. <clears throat> Seek the kingdom of heaven within. And what does he mean by within? He means within. So said Hermes, so said the Buddha. The language of God is not English nor Latin. The language of God is cellular and molecular. I want to suggest a very simple rule to clarify this ancient and agonizing confusion about abuse and control, freedom, regulation. Uh, my simple rule will, would have prevented the 30 years war in the past, and it can prevent what will become a 30 years war in the immediate future over the use and control of psychedelic drugs. It's a very simple golden rule. What is without, what is behavioral, what is overt and visible, belongs to Caesar and the law of God. I'm sorry, the law of man. But what is within is God. Now, who is God? I am God. But you are God, too. Now, in our society, a person who goes around saying, I am God, is likely to get into trouble. <laughs> At other times in our Judeo-Christian and Protestant culture, you could be killed, burned, quartered, and drawn for that simple statement, I am God. Today, uh, the person who says, I am God, his wife uh, calls the doctor. The doctor calls in the psychiatrist. And uh, if he insists upon uh, repeating this claim, such a person is likely to end up not on a stake or in prison, but in our modern um, locale for such incarceration, the mental hospital. Now, for most of human history, and even today in most of the world, particularly the Eastern world, the man who says, you know, I am God, is likely to get this reaction. His neighbor will say, congratulations, uh, you finally caught on. The standard term of greeting in India is namaste. Namaste means not uh, hi babe or hello there, it means I salute the God within you. Now, let me define a little more empirically and operationally what I mean by 
the phrase, I am God. I mean that nothing exists out there except that it is registered in my consciousness, in my nervous system. I create my universe. You create your universe. Believe it or not, and we may not want to take credit for it, but uh, we're stuck with it. I created this room. And you created it too. Uh, I didn't create it for you. Uh, but I created this room by having um, accepted the ontological possibility of a Harvard Law School forum and having transported myself here. I had plenty of choices not to create this room. I could have stayed in India under a bamboo tree writing poetry two years ago, uh, in which case I would never have heard of this evening's forum nor created this room for this particular cosmic drama tonight. There's a tremendous latitude which um, develops from this conception of consciousness. Anything is possible because uh, your consciousness creates it all. I can create a world in which I am Napoleon or Nathan Pusey. <laughs> and you can't pass a law against my believing it. You see, everything is paranoia in the sense that everything that we think and experience is a systematized delusion. It's all centered in your nervous system. Now, when I act on my paranoias, if I walk into um, President Pusey's office tomorrow and say, I'm Nathan Pusey, fire Timothy Leary, I'll be invited to leave. And if I refuse to leave, society is justified in forcibly ushering me out of that particular game headquarters. You see, what I have done, if I walk in the middle of Harvard Square and say, uh, I am Napoleon, uh, back all those Russians to the wall and shoot them, I have confused the inner and the outer. I have confused my neurological right to experience anything I want to experience with a social and behavioral situation where my rights are rightly limited by the tribal and social game. And there are many ways, as we know, for changing the tribal and social legislative situation. Indeed, I'm involved at the present time in six such attempts to change our laws. <laughs> My profession at the present time is one that um, I was never told about when I was a, an undergraduate or a graduate student. Um, I'm a scholar of consciousness. In other generations or in other places, I would be called a shaman or a priest or a hermetic scholar or an esoteric teacher. It all comes down to the same thing. For the last seven years, I have specialized and worked very hard in my profession to attempt to change consciousness, to map consciousness, and to teach people how to discover their internal divinity. Now, it's built into all of our uh, traditions and folklores that the person who is concerned with changing internal things, or the person who defends and protects the right of people to uh, change the internal situation. The person who has control of the sacraments for changing things inside should not be involved with uh, routine, secular, or material uh, ambitions. We expect our priests or our shamans to avoid uh, wealth, to avoid power. The golden rule is, what I feel or believe or experience is my business, but what I do is all of our businesses and reward or punish me according to whether I 
play the game well, ethically and rightly, or unethically. But there's one uneasy borderline between what is external and what is internal. And this borderline is defined exactly by the sense organs and the skin and the introduction of external things within my own body. Consciousness is altered by physical events and physical objects which impinge upon my sense organs or which I introduce into my body. Now the name traditionally given to external objects or processes which change you internally is sacrament. Sacraments are the visible and tangible techniques for bringing you close to your own divinity. Now, the interesting thing is about most sacraments are, if you look back upon them, they all have something to do with your sense organs. Incense, repetitious prayer, robes and costumes, rose windows, statues, communions, elixirs. Sacraments are dangerous. They've always been dangerous. Indeed, if a sacrament is not dangerous, it doesn't work. But what do sacraments endanger? A sacrament which works changes your internal stability. It changes you inside. It alters your nervous system. It puts you in a different state of consciousness, which, if it's really a good sacrament, will shatter and permanently change many of the stabilities upon which you centered your life. But there's really very little external danger to sacraments. People who take psychedelic drugs, for example, don't murder or steal, they don't get in fights. There's in one case in the last 23 years of someone who claimed to have committed a murder under the influence of LSD, and that case for those of us who know more about it, is highly dubious. It is said that LSD can cause suicide. And it's true that anything which changes your consciousness can lead to feelings of depression and uh, revulsion. But still, the suicide rate associated with LSD is remarkably low, even in spite of the psychiatric propaganda which consistently links LSD and defenestration. When we talk about the external dangers of LSD, we have to play the game fairly. We have to say LSD is dangerous in compared to what? Let's take, for example, a college education. The statistics tell us that every year 1,000 college students kill themselves another 9,000 attempt suicide, and another 90,000 publicly ruminate about it. <clears throat> the number of suicides attributed to LSD are perhaps between five and 10, which uh, is remarkably low considering the probably several million people who have taken LSD, which uh, leads me to suggest that perhaps uh, LSD can prevent suicide in uh, many people who uh, might otherwise do it. I consider such things as the Vietnam, Vietnam War dangerous to our external security. I consider race uh, problems dangerous to our external uh, security. I consider the pollution of the air uh, dangerous to our external security. But uh, sacraments are not dangerous uh, externally, but they do inevitably stir up fear and awe and terror in the people who don't use them. We're all afraid of the other guy's sacraments. And, and rather understandably so, because um, when a person takes a sacrament which works, no matter what it is, it can be sexual, it can be monastic, you know, when your child joins a nunnery or a monastery, when a person gets involved in a sacramental uh, search, we, we tend to lose him. Uh, 
he no longer responds to our uh, rewards and punishments. So we can't condition him. Um, he's, uh, we can't control him. And those of us who, for even the best motives, want a society where people can be conditioned and controlled uh, to virtue and conformity, there's nothing that can be more upsetting than a sacrament which works. Because if we know anything from history, we know that the religious person is notoriously uh, unresponsive to um, the usual rewards and punishments. It's always been the despair of the bureaucrat that he shakes his fist or his club or uh, his cross at the religious person and he said, I don't buy it. So let me summarize. God and man and law. Secular law render unto Caesar, all of them, what is due them in terms of external behavior. But divine law tells me that my body is sacred. I urge you, or I challenge you, don't you really feel the same way about your body? You cannot interfere with the workings of my body. Your society can't. Nor can you interfere or control my sacraments, the techniques, the visible objects or processes which I use to intensify and enhance and expand my internal vistas. Another aspect of divine law is I cannot impose my sacraments on you. We hear a lot these days about the abuse of LSD and other drugs or the control of LSD and other drugs. To me, drug abuse is a drug in the hands of society being used on other people. The only abuse of drugs is the control of drugs by other people because the only sensible control of things which affect the inner workings of your body is self-control. The only control is self-control. Now let me be specific about uh, some of these sacramental methods. Anything that affects your senses, what you see is your business. What you hear, what you allow to vibrate on the trembling membranes of your uh, auditory uh, system is your business. What you allow to touch your body or what you allow to enter your body is your business. Now throughout history, and particularly at the present time, there's a no lack of government officials eager to define and enforce laws to determine what you and I can put inside our bodies. I refer in particular to laws controlling sex and drugs, amphetamines, barbiturates, alcohol, nicotine are all very dangerous drugs. I would even include the poisons in this uh, point of view. If you want to introduce a poison into your body, whether it's tobacco or cyanide, it's nobody bus business but your own. Our study of the history of divinities shows us that at certain times, Krishna wants to pull down the curtain or turn off the light. And if you want to kill yourself, <clears throat> through nicotine or cyanide, it's your business, it's my business not societies. There's one other issue in respect to God and law and man, and that is where do we practice our sacramental procedures? We agree that we don't want to have laws saying that Negroes and whites or Jews and Gentiles can take drugs together or make love together. That's their business. But can they do it in Harvard Square? Or can they do it here in the platform? Or in a kindergarten? This issue has been fought out, 
and legislated both in law and folklore for thousands of years. The place that you perform a sacramental act, the place that you pursue your divinity through your sense organs and the entrances to your body is called a shrine. A shrine is a place designated for no other game except the game of worship. If a person crosses the threshold of his shrine, whether it's his house or temple in his uh, neighborhood, and breaks any social law, arrest him. If people who belong to our religion, which is called the League for Spiritual Discovery, leave their shrines either during, after, or before smoking marijuana or taking LSD, and they wreck cars, or they snatch purses, or they cause public disorder, arrest them. We have plenty of laws for that. But what people do in the privacy of their homes or their designated shrines with instruments which affect only their sense organs or chemical or electrical processes which affect only their consciousness is their business. Now the paradox is that you won't, you can't accept the divinity of another person unless you accept your own divinity. If you legislate against the sacraments of another person, you're limiting your own sacred possibilities. What we do outside, let man govern. What we do inside is your and my divine right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leary. A physician once sat through a judge's court and went up to the judge after he'd watched him perform in a few trials and he said, Judge, how can you decide these cases so quickly and so easily and always come to such a, a swift decision? The judge said, it's very easy. He says, I listen to the plaintiff and then I make up my mind. And the physician thought and said, you listen to the plaintiff and make up your mind. What about the defendant? Don't you listen to what he has to say? And the judge said, well, I used to, but I gave it up because I got confused. Uh, we're now going to hear, I won't call it the other side, because this is really not a debate, but uh, we're privileged to have on the platform here this evening uh, Dr. Norman Zinberg, who is presently Assistant Clinical Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard University Medical School. And Dr. Zinberg is a leading psychiatrist in the Boston area and has uh, been active in group psychotherapy in which LSD and the other hallucinogenic drugs may well play an important role. Uh, he received his A.B. and M.D. from the University of Maryland and is presently on the staffs of McLean Hospital in Belmont and the Beth Israel Hospital. Dr. Zinberg. I really am sort of surprised to be involved in a discussion on drugs. I got into it in rather a funny way. But essentially, I was interested in doctors. And if you're interested in doctors, you find that they use some drugs and don't use others and are afraid of some and don't mind so much about the others. And so uh, suddenly I found myself in studying the doctors in this really quite sticky subject. And uh, I find myself now chiefly a student of the social scene and in a funny way a classifier. And I'm quite lost in this sort of expansionist and reduction world of the drug takers. And for me, it's certainly been an experience. What I noticed about doctors is that uh, they were really quite afraid of narcotics, among other drugs. And a whole group of drugs, which I call the pernicious drugs in terms of uh, their responses to them, 
Uh, and I found that most of the work that had been done on drugs had been done on lower socioeconomic groups uh, of the so-called hardcore addicts, and that this sort of work was not very much help to doctors whose practice was essentially in the middle or upper uh, socioeconomic groups, and that it was obvious that many drug takers didn't fit any simple social pattern as the one that was usually presented with the hardcore addict. And I tried to look into why the doctors were so frightened of these drugs, and I found they really had quite good reasons to be. That the legal issues that had developed over the last half century were very confusing, and uh, really made their position very unclear in the use of, of many uh, such drugs. And I found that they knew very little about them, that it was really very surprising how ignorant we were about the uh, physiology, the sociology, the psychology of uh, many drugs. that they knew very little about them, that it was really very surprising how ignorant we were about the uh, physiology, the sociology, the psychology of uh, many drugs, and that what had happened was a whole realm of fantasy, myth, misconception uh, had grown up, which had been generated chiefly from the press and uh, partially from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. So that over the last few years, I've had a chance to see many, many cases of drugs. Uh, they're referred to me. I'm called from different hospitals to come look at cases, uh, and one thing or another. So I've seen uh, quite a few. And I find that the distinction between physiological and psychological addiction, so-called, what, in other words, is what people think and what they actually experience physiologically, is all but meaningless. And I think this finding is of some importance in a variety of drugs. Certainly, uh, nicotine would be one of them. Now, I was led to conclude that narcotics was really not as large a problem as it's been made to seem by the uh, huge number of articles that have been written about it, most of them in the uh, most blatant and frightening terms. So that I found myself classifying the people who use drugs uh, in two essential ways, and I called one group the oblivion seekers, and the other group the experience seekers. Now, the oblivion seekers were a group that it was very easy to classify, that they usually came from socially deprived backgrounds and had very specific personality types. Uh, their profiles, their personality profiles, and their social profiles were very easily delineated. They were people who essentially had uh, begun to smoke cigarettes by the time they were six or seven. Liquor, sex at 13, promiscuity and petty thievery would merge in late adolescence almost automatically into prostitution and organized crime. And yet, this group of people who became the hardcore drug users uh, still differed from non-addictive delinquents of, of similar backgrounds. Now, they differed in a number of ways. The chief way being that when they set out to use their drug of choice, and it was invariably heroin after a time, they uh, simply knew they were going to become addicted, that they would need the drug in an in a almost total sense from the time that they took their first dose. And yet, in studying this group, it was quite striking to find how different they were from what I at least would have thought they were uh, before I began to study them. For one thing, the whole question of mental illness. There have been many reports that indicated that a fair percentage of the hardcore heroin addicts, my oblivion seekers, the people who sought to get out of the world that they couldn't bear, uh, were mentally sick. That uh, initial reports indicated that 20% of them were better with schizophrenic. In a recent study that was done in New York State, it was on they were only able to find in the whole New York State hospital system one person who had been a classified addict who was hospitalized for mental illness. And many of the follow-up studies of the patients who had been at Lexington have confirmed this report. So there is practically no incidence of psychosis, of, of, of intensive psychosis and schizophrenics among the mentally ill. This differs quite sharply from the criminal delinquents. There is a very interesting finding of cultural disparity among these uh, oblivion seekers that uh, Northern-born uh, drug takers had, for instance, Southern-born parents twice as often as you would expect from census figures. This is true of immigrant backgrounds, too. While, and this is particularly true of the Negro population, uh, who have a somewhat higher percentage of narcotic addicts than the white, 
but that only 12% of them were themselves immigrants. And I'm using the word immigrants if they'd migrated from another section of the country as well as from another, uh, from literally another nationality. And, and very few of them were themselves drug takers. So that what you found was that the drug takers came from families which had a sharp cultural disparity, where the children were brought up in an atmosphere quite different from that that the family had been used to, and it seems in general that the family longed for, that they missed in many respects. The instance of homosexuality, which has received a fair amount of publicity, turned out to be virtually nil. In a series of over 500 uh, people who were interviewed from Lexington, only three of, this is uh, again hardcore drug addicts, only three indicated that any sort of major kind of cultural, of uh, sexual gratification came from homosexuality. Again, a very interesting finding was that these people maintain significant relationships with a maternal figure to an almost incredible extent. Many of them came from broken homes, not to the extent that the uh, usual delinquent did. I think the usual delinquent, 71% came from broken homes, and with the uh, drug addicts, it was down around 35 or 40%, where one or another parent had died, or in general, the home uh, didn't exist. But with those who, main, who had some kind of maternal figure to maintain contact with, they ma maintained this contact to a remarkable extent. That almost 70% of them lived with some aspect of their family of origin, usually a maternal figure. And that they married very frequently and maintained a very close contact with either a legal marriage or a common-in-law marriage. This again differs very sharply from the delinquents. And when it comes to crime, the same thing turns out to be true. That it isn't that drug taking makes criminals, criminals take drugs. And that uh, over 70% of the people who were listed as addicts had themselves been criminals before they became drug takers. Now once this happens, of course, a vicious circle sets in. That in order to maintain their habit, they have to continue uh, criminal acts in order to get the kind of money they need and so on and so forth. And pretty soon they're in uh, sort of major trouble. But in general, the profile looks like a very dependent kind of person. A person who really hangs on to his mother whenever he has a chance, who uh, really can't bear the fact that he can't communicate with his family, that he's not really so much sick as he is depressed, which turns out to be the one significant mental illness one finds among addicts. And this is borne out by how they can be treated. The best treatment known so far for these oblivion seekers, for the narcotic addicts, is involuntary parole that if they have to report to someone at regular intervals and maintain a kind of contact, they really do very well. They hold on to their jobs, and very often they give up drugs. Uh, in fact, a lot of publicity has been given to the use of methadone recently in New York State as a replacement for uh, heroin addiction. And they say that the people do quite well. Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this were true, although I'm very unconvinced about methadone as a specific antagonist because all of the history of uh, drug ad addiction is that, uh, that every time a new drug is discovered, it's used as a treatment for the old drug. Heroin was first introduced as a treatment for narcotic addiction, uh, morphine addiction specifically. So um, I don't know about methadone, but methadone has the most severe of all withdrawal syndromes. It's much harder to get off methadone than it is heroin. So once they put people on methadone and they let them come in every other night to get their shots, I have a feeling that it works pretty well. Uh, it's a form of involuntary parole. Then we get to the experience seekers. Now, the experience seekers, as a group, have a terrible fear of lifelessness. They're terrified of missing something, of not really living to the full. And very often, they're accepted by our culture as rebels, and they use all sorts of drugs, uh, often alone, sometimes in sprees. But they rarely use heroin. In all of the uh, people I've studied in this group, uh, the idea that the use of marijuana, uh, the amphetamines, barbiturates, LSD will inevitably lead down the road to H seems to be a pure fantasy. That with the exception of a certain kind of adolescent who uh, really is fairly disturbed and who is hanging around with a group of people who begin to try, uh, let's say, smoke pot uh, on a big night or something like that, and, uh, and he feels he's very much one of the group. And then it turns out that all the rest of the people in the group are pretty beat, and they think they're hippies, and occasionally they smoke pot. They're still going to school, and they might graduate, and what have you. But this guy, while he thinks he's a member of the group, is not taking the life steps at the moment that 
that the rest of the people are taking them. They may take a year off, but he takes three years off. And pretty soon, um, one way or another, they've gone on with whatever they decide their life's task is, and this guy suddenly finds that he's not a member of the group anymore, and that he really can't find this kind of group support. And incidentally, I, I think the group support is a very pertinent factor, which I'll get to in a minute. And so he drifts from one group to another, and it's very possible that this person could drift from a group of experience seekers to a group of oblivion seekers, and in that way end up uh, using heroin. But it's really quite unusual. Mostly they end up in a psychiatrist's office first. Uh, now, there's no specific personality to the uh, personality pattern to the experience seekers in quite the same way that there is for the oblivion seekers. That mostly they come from the middle and upper socioeconomic classes. One of the differences is that there's a great deal of psychosis among the experience seekers. That, uh, although uh, I don't know exactly what it means in terms of the number, and this is something I'll mention again later, people are using it. Uh, at a hospital like Bellevue, they now estimate that 8% of their admissions for uh, psychotic breaks come from uh, the use of various these experience seeking drugs, particularly LSD, and the Mass Mental Health Center in town reports a similar figure. Uh, but there's a great difficulty in research in this group. There's trouble with controls. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, one of the contentions is with this group that there is uh, a group effect and that uh, the effect of the drug is not the same when taken alone or taken in a laboratory setting when taken in a congenial group setting and so on. This is something in which people have tried to work a little bit but uh, without really coming up with very much that I know of. Uh, it's very hard to know whether this six or eight percent admissions to the large mental hospitals in the big cities represent, you know, 20 percent of the people that take LSD, for instance, or does it represent one percent? Does it represent uh, an indication that if you take LSD a certain number of times, there'll be a trip that fails and that you end up in a mental hospital or not? We simply don't know. There's very little uh, that can tell us about this at this point. Now, as a social psychologist, let me mention the social responses of people to the drug takers. And in line with my current addiction, let me classify them. And I've divided them into uh, people who respond to drug takers uh, the sort of soft school, the romanticizers, and the hard school are the punishers. And it's really quite striking in everything that I can read how often they fall into these two categories and rarely anything in between. Now the soft school, the romanticizers, uh, sentimentalize the drug taking as rebels. Um, they esteem the rebelliousness of the experience seekers uh, and they really don't recognize the oblivion seekers for what they are but look upon them as sort of the new varieties of the old social hero made intellectually respectable in our time by the followers of D.H. Lawrence as the noble savage. And for them, particularly, members of the lower class have a special earthy knowledge about life. Now, the moral support given, given to these drug takers by sentimentalists is really quite pernicious and it requires a closer look. In a recent New Yorker article, Dr. Maria Niswander, who's well known for work with drug addicts, discussed a sad, tortured charge with a reporter. She described a young, confirmed opiate dependent who wanted to be committed to a state hospital for three years, and she was reported to having said, man may be able to experience freedom in a degree we can't yet imagine. That's why drug addicts strike me as being among the few comparatively free people I've met. The addict's relationships, except when he's scrounging for drugs, are honest and direct. Deceit is not a basic part of his personality. So that here we see the drug addict taking on the charm of the noble savage, here transformed into the social primitive. His nature is assimilated to the supposedly unspoiled nature of the child. The drug user rejects our hard, competitive adult world and returns to a simple world of children where truth and beauty are self-evident. He experiences life freely. He's untouched by fraud, oppression, pettiness, and despair. What matter if his arms are somewhat scarred? Well. Uh, another member of the sentimental school, Mabel Dodge Lewin, uh, some years ago, lived in Taos with D.H. Lawrence. And she once decried the dismal accretion of cars and stoves and sinks in white American homes and proclaimed the superiority of the American Indian because he did not want this paraphernalia of progress. Her noble Indian had not yet learned or had not yet been forced to learn to sublimate his biological energies. 
He was still honest and direct, still without deceit. The blood of his forefathers was still stronger in him, she said, than his need for the modern multiplicity of things. A young Arizona Indian in the local Teos newspaper replied to Mrs. Lewin's idealization, so akin to that of the Harlem Clinic doctor. Noting that Mrs. Lewin had moved into a fine new house with a soundproof bedroom, a magnificent kitchen, several fine bathrooms, he angrily proposed that they exchange places. <laughs> you can have all the horse and buggies you want, and I'll have your nice new cars. You drink muddy water from the fountains, and I and my wife will drink nice clean water from your faucets. We want to live like humans and not like animals. D.H. Lawrence said of Mrs. Lewin, she hates the white world and loves the Indian out of hate. Now, there is the hard school as well, and, and they go exactly in the opposite direction. Incidentally, one of the things that should be said is there's a certain amount of truth, in a way, in Dr. Niswander's characterization of the drug addict, that many that I've met have this certain lack of guile. And I think it's very easy to explain that if you give up the difficulty of the modern world, if you give up the question of choice, if you devote your life utterly to one thing, the search for drugs, and give up having to balance one responsibility against another, to slight one thing in order to acquire something else, to take care of another uh, demand of some aspect of the world, in order to give up, in order to go into simply this one thing, it's very easy to look as if you were without deceit. Because uh, it's the question of, of managing many responsibilities that keeps people confused and uncertain. Now, the hard school uh, have chiefly been the lawmakers. And it's really uh, quite remarkable to read some of their prose. Uh, <laughs> that really, they feel that any use of drugs is due entirely to moral turpitude that if anybody uses drugs at all, that automatically they're bad. And really, no moralizing government agency than the Fe has ever existed in the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. Um, they reflect very directly the 19th century attitude of the temperance societies. One drink <laughs> makes a confirmed drunkard, you know. Um, or the 19th century public attitude towards sex. One illicit experience makes a prostitute. Uh, and they've pointed out again and again that one single dose of any of the drugs on their list, after one dose, dreadful moral deterioration sets in. <laughs> Human perversity being what it is, anyone reading one of their publications may well conclude that if drugs are so sinful, they must be fun. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to quote from Mr. Anslinger, who was uh, Commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for a number of years, from one of his many case illustrations. Uh, collecting his cases is really a life's work almost. And he has a few of many cases which illustrate the homicidal tendencies and the general debasing effects arising from the use of marijuana. He cites the case of a cotton picker, 25 years old, who smoked a single reefer, picked up a 17-month-old baby girl who had been left in her family car, violated and suffocating her. He violated and suffocated her. Ignoring the complexity of motives in so heinous a crime, Anslinger concludes, the real criminal in this case is marijuana. Uh, now, in a funny way, although the FBN, since Anslinger is retired, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics has changed a little bit, but, um, and, and makes more intelligent pronouncements, but essentially their position is still the same. In a recent interview with a Justin Department official and uh, talking about the complexity of the whole drug problem, he, he said, in, re in response to my question, he said it's very simple. Now, about $5 million a year is spent enforcing the Harrison Act. To keep drug users comfortable costs probably $25,000 a year, most of which comes from crime. Incidentally, he was not talking only about narcotic users. If there are only 50,000 addicts are involved, by simple arithmetic, you arrive at a figure of $125 million yearly that the public in a sense pays for drug habits. Put that much money in the hands of the proper agency and we will eliminate the drug traffic. Uh, he may have thought it was simple but I thought his arithmetic and his thinking was rather simple too because he failed to take into account such obviously germane facts as previous criminality, the lesson of prohibition, the constantly increasing difficulty any one country has of sealing its borders and acting unilaterally and so on. 
and he fails entirely to consider the drug problem as it's related to the experience seekers. Now, um, as a nation, we are drug takers, and this is where I think the problem chiefly comes in. From 1961 to 1965, we went from 2.5 billion to 4.3 billion a year spent on drugs, and this is simply over-the-counter drug, I mean, per, uh, per prescription over-the-counter. It doesn't include any institutional use of drugs. And that's an enormous figure and growing at a much more rapid rate than, uh, than any other specific figure of, uh, of spending in this culture. So it really lends a certain credence to the rebellion. Drug taking is a sacred cow. A lot of the young people who take drugs are doing the same things that their parents are doing, but doing it in such a way that it creates the kind of rebellion and anxiety that I think they anticipate. And it's very difficult to set up any situation which moves away from either of these extremes and sets up a uh, sort of a research orientation, an orientation that would really try to find out what had happened. It seems to me that we're on the verge of repeating many past mistakes, that the uh, federal, uh, the FDA has now a police force, that we have one more police force, you know, the FBI, then the Bureau of Narcotics, and now we have a police force in the FDA. And I don't really know what one more police force is going to do in this problem. Because it seems to me that there's a reaction emotionally in both directions. Another aspect of the punishing school, which I'll mention only briefly, and I forgot to state, was the reason that I thought this high diagnosis of schizophrenia occurs among the drug addicts was also a form of punishing. I think that very often what the doctors experience is that anybody who is so willing to throw away his life and uh, to uh, be in such disregard of so many mores, they figure must be very sick. So they diagnose them as schizophrenic. And I think that's where the discrepancy comes, occurs in the figures. Now, I really suspect that there's probably no one single solution, that one would have to think of many, many different approaches to those people who really are having uh, drug problems. And the study of the peculiar nature of the disease, its incidence in groups more than individuals, it's spread by contagion, because uh, one drug user does infect another, it's uh, subsequent infection, of those who want warmth and closeness and social support for various propensities, but particularly dependency, will teach us a great deal more than just about drug taking if we study it successfully. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Zinberg. I'd like to address the question to Dr. Leary. Uh, you spoke with great awe and respect, I think, for the human body and the human mind and what it's capable of. And I was wondering if you'd, you'd care to comment on the possibility of a man who doesn't use LSD or other drugs, peyote, what have you, uh, what the possi possibility is of him attaining this higher consciousness and this mind expansion by the simple study and use of his own body and his own mind without these recent drugs. Without what? I didn't get the question. Without these recent drugs was the last, uh, the last phrase of it. Is, is a man who doesn't use these, these drugs, these uh, recent drugs, Freud thought it was co codeine, uh, codeine, and you think it's LSD, um, can a man who doesn't use drugs in his system, who simply lives naturally, who falls in love, who likes nature, who lives, can a man like this attain this higher consciousness and this expansion of mind that you speak of in all your articles? Without drugs. Without drugs, yes. Yeah. Well, there are thousands of roads within. And uh, throughout human history, men have been willing to kill each other, the other quite easily over, uh, I prefer my uh, gateway to the divinity, and I'm going to stop you from using yours. Uh, if you have any way of uh, turning on, I don't care what it is, God speak to you, use it. But, uh, uh, you know, you, you just cannot stop uh, uh, our group uh, from using our method. We don't urge anyone else. We don't uh, pass laws making you take LSD. As a matter of fact, I pronounced the new commandment tonight and said, no one has the right to uh, alter anyone else's consciousness. That's uh, a key tenet in uh, our beliefs. But uh, on the other hand, nobody has a right to stop me from changing my own conscience. And I also want to pick up on one thing which you said, and of course this question is uh, one that I have had to answer so thousands of times in the last seven years. 
people use the word natural. And of course, natural always belongs to the other guy, right? Uh, and artificial always belongs to, uh, to the, uh, the opposition. I find you saying, don't, don't, shouldn't we do this in a natural way? And by natural, they mean, of course, what they were taught in Sunday school. Uh, chemicals were around and have been used in religion uh, for thousands of years. Soma and hashish and these other plants. What is natural to me is uh, these, uh, these botanical species, which interact directly with the nervous system. And what I consider artificial is four years at Harvard and the Bible and uh, St. Patrick's Cathedral and the Sunday school teachings. Uh, when you stick only to nature and uh, the beautiful uh, sunset. Man, I'm with you, but, uh, you know, uh, aren't, aren't you addicted or don't you uh, read books? And what about books? carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? What about Fords? What about uh, anything else that you Our religion is working on that. Give us 10 years. <laughs> well, we've come to the end of a most interesting evening. I'd like to... Uh, close it with a, with a quotation from William James. He said that our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, while all about it, part of by the, from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. No account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness disregarded. How to regard them? is the question. We've tried to answer it or discuss it, and thank you all for your attention.